We are talking about heart attacks today. We are talking about acute coronary syndrome. And clearly, you have my slides. You also have a handout. Anybody that put, oh, there it is. See this? Hello. This is the handout. This is me with my words speaking to you. And last Saturday, I sat and revised this puppy and added some stuff. As I see new things in the unit, I the book can't keep up with what we're learning in clinical. So it, you must meet, you have your hand <coughs> up, and it kind of it jives pretty well with the slides. So you don't need to know any definition, but I want you to remember it's all about supply and demand when you have a heart attack. Oxygen rich blood supply should equal demand. And when that's not the case, you're gonna have problems. You're gonna have problems. And I don't want you to just think it's coronary artery disease and all of a sudden those vessels, you know, close up one day. It's a clot. And so that's why today I'm giving you two handouts. One is the STEMI tracker, which is just a quality improvement tool that anybody having a STEMI, we're going to mark the times of how we did, how we did to see if we met the mark. And in our case study after break, we didn't meet the mark for a couple of reasons. Our guy delayed and it was a Sunday, and the, the cath lab was ready to rock and roll after 30, 45 minutes. Cardiologist didn't get there for another 25 minutes. Bummer. So we're gonna look at this, and we're gonna look at this. This is hot off the press. If you look at this, somewhere it says 2023. This is what EJ does, dual antiplatelet therapy. Once you've gotten a stent, and it's a drug-coated stent, you go and hold them on this, dual antiplatelet therapy, aspirin, and an ADP receptor antagonist, and don't stop taking it, honey, because you will re -stenose. That's pretty much my message today, but let's talk about it. So oxygen, supply, and demand, that's what it's all about. All right, what I'm about to do, you already know, but I want you to, in just a second, close your eyes, because we're gonna trace a drop of blood through the heart, and every place that I mention could be have an area for a complication from an MI. I will speak to everything here saying after an MI, this could be a problem area. Close your eyes. Remember the venous blood comes back via the superior, boom, Sarah Jane dropped a pencil. She's like having yellow on the ground trying to find it. The rolls go and ran, there you go, kid. So, all right, after Caitlin, after you assume the position, close your eyes. Venous blood comes back to the right atrium via the superior and inferior vena cava. It goes through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. From the RV, it goes through the front door of the pulmonary artery and the pulmonic valve. Into the pulmonary artery to the lungs where that deoxygenated blood picks up oxygen. The oxygenated blood then returns via the pulmonary veins to the left atrium through the mitral valve into the big mammogram pump of the heart, the left ventricle, through the front door of the aorta, the aortic valve, into the aorta, and all the vital organs get perfused. And the first thing fed off the um, aorta is the coronary arteries. Open up your eyes. We're gonna talk about complications in every single space. So if you've got that figured out, you can figure out anything. What does right-sided heart failure look like? Well, uh, the RV's too pooped to pump, so you got neck vein distension. What does left ventricular failure look like? Well, the LV's too pooped to pump, and so it's backing up into lungs. There's your acute pulmonary edema. And you already knew that. You already knew that. Conduction system is fed by the coronary <coughs> arteries. So we're gonna see who feeds what. Are you responsible for testing that? I want you to know what the RCA feeds and the LED feeds, no. But if anybody works in the ER, wants to work in the ER right after school or critical care, it would be fun to know because you'd be empowered and the more you know, the more fun you have at work. Um, and I'll show you examples of that. So the electricity, we know where it travels, it's all fed by the coronary arteries. So therefore, if there's a blockage in that coronary artery, anticipate problems there. The RCA, my God, this is a common blockage. So many MIs we see are inferior walls. And before I even start, and I'm, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm cheating on my Tuesday, people, but on Wednesday afternoon, my eight Wednesday students, raise your hands. We all had the opportunity. Good morning. Here you go, kid. 
This is for you. At four o'clock, there was a STEMI in the ED, beeper alert. So there were three of the students that were all kind of caught up and everybody else was at their bedside. So I grabbed those three and I said, let's run in the ER. And there they were all there. It was not the scene I was expecting to find. I'd be expecting to find, not that I want to have a STEMI or a non-STEMI or unstable injury or anything, but I would expect a patient that is awake saying, I'm having chest pain, they do it, you know, the EKG's already been done, they identify ST elevation, and we're running to the cath lab. But what we found was a code situation. What we found was a 59-year-old black male laying flat on the stretcher, um, already intubated, assist control rate of 24, tidal volume 450, FIO2 100 percent 5 a peak, not breathing over it, on a norepinephrine drip, that ain't a good sign. You're not perfusion three yet, but that is a vasoconstriction to give the man a blood pressure. And um, what we heard was that he was fully resuscitated with the Lucas device. The students even said, what's that mark on his chest? It was from the Lucas device, which is a contraption that does contra compressions for you. And, um, and they said, what's that thing in his, in his shoulder? What do you call that? There you go, intraosseous. I, I blanked. A, an intraosseous because they didn't have a line. Well, you know what? Sometimes it's hard to find a line when somebody's dead. Really? Okay, so it's not the scene we expected. And then this gentleman had the dreaded bowel movement. And I told my three students, this man, this is not going to be good. I'm here, you probably already know it, but when a person is getting ready to die, they evacuate their bowels. The man had a bowel movement. I'm like, this is not good. And so I'm just gonna give you the whole, even Dr. Udo spiel. There was a Catholic priest that came by and he was hesitant to go in to bless the patient. And I said, Father, as a Catholic, if this were my big brother, I'm asking you to go in and bless this man. One of the ER nurses was kind of like, oh no, you can go talk to the family in the waiting room. And I'm like, Father, he, he needs a little, please, for me. I didn't say for me, but for me, I needed this man because I knew what was coming. Okay. So we go to the cath lab. We, we moved as quickly, were we running? We were moving good. And I asked the girls, you feel the burn? You feel your thighs burning? And they were like, yes ma'am. As fast as you can move a stretcher with a ventilator and respiratory bag at them and all that, we got to the cath lab. Not one, not two, but three cardiologists worked on him. And um, guess where his occlusion was? It wasn't just the LAD or the CERC or the RCA, it was his left main. So two thirds of his heart muscle had no flow. This was not good. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, there's two RNs, two RNs in the cath lab, and they were moving faster than I've seen any critical care nurse move. Maxed out on norepinephrine, maxed out on epi, getting by far, but I looked at my eight grads and I asked the question, do new grads belong in the cath lab? And they collectively said, no, no. no. It, it, you know what I mean? Like. So, can you stent the left main? They didn't in the past, but lately I've seen some cowboy cardiologists that have. They are attempting to stent the LED to give him a chance. Why? Because he's 59. And he was at work on Wednesday and said to his colleagues, I don't feel good. And he collapsed. Mm -hmm. So they were trying to save this young man. 59's young, if you don't agree with that, Talk to me after class. At 59 is young. And um, then uh, maybe they were putting in an impella device, not on your chest, but it's a device with a propeller to give him some cardiac output. They were trying everything. And finally, one of my students said, Ms. Garrison, one of the cardiologists is doing compressions. So they called it at 1802. Mm -hmm. That's not how a STEMI is supposed to go. But I'm here to tell you that 50% of STEMIs die, die of sudden cardiac death, 50%. There is so much we can do to fix them. And you may have heard rumor that, oh, Ms. Garrison loves a STEMI in the ED. I do, but I love the STEMI in the ED where they're awake and we get them to the cath lab and we meet our mark zero to 90 minutes door to balloon and we salvage their heart muscle. This was a sad day. And when we're walking out of post-conference, and I, I regret that we didn't debrief. I regret that we didn't debrief more. 
Um, but little Tia Thibodeau was leaving. I said, how are you feeling about this? She goes, I'm going to say it, Ms. Harrison. I said, me too. It, work is hard. Work is tough. And so all this professional issue stuff, it's real. Healthy work environment, if you don't have a healthy work environment, that kind of situation can destroy you. I needed that priest more than that man needed that priest because I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming for him. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. That's what we're going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right coronary artery, it's like my favorite. It feeds the right side of the heart. It's all in your hand. Out. It feeds the right atrium. It feeds the right ventricle. It feeds the inferior wall of the left ventricle. Have you ever heard of an inferior wall MI? I bet my house it's the RCA. The RCA feeds that. What are the leads? The leads that look down at the inferior wall of the heart. And are you going to be responsible to know that two, three, and ABF are your inferior leads? No. But if you're going to be that new brand in the ER, you want to know that. You, know, you want to know that. Because think about it. It feeds the inferior wall, the left ventricle. It feeds the SA node in 55% of people and the AB node in 90% of people. So when you see that ST elevation in 2, 3, and ABF, mm -hmm. you're thinking, what other structures might be affected? The SA node and the AB node? Get the atropine. Keep it close. You might need it. The main complication from an inferior wall MI mm -hmm. is symptomatic bradycardia. So just be ready for that. Um, and then, hey, it also feeds, let's look at that last slide, the, post, the back of this septal wall. This septum dividing, it's muscle. It feeds the back of that. So you know what? When there's lack of blood supply, you can develop a necrotic hole in this. So you get a good baseline assessment at 8 a.m. because when that patient hits their call button at 9.30, the day after his STEMI, he might say, hey, nurse, I'm really acutely short of breath. And you listen. And at first you heard, love dub, love dub, and um, just clear breath sounds. And now you hear a shh. Uh-oh, uh-oh, something is different. Make a call. Because that man needs to go possibly to surgery because he de developed a VSD. Remember that ventricular septal defect that y'all learned in level three? Oh, the baby has a VSD, they have a little murmur, but no worries, if it closes by one year of age, they're good to go. My niece Gabby had that, and she's, it closed at one year of age, all good. Just had a baby boy, same with him. And we're all like, no big deal, it's gonna be fine. But this is a big deal. You with me? I know, it's incredible, it's incredible. So that's the RCA. Mm -mm -mm. Widowmaker, LAD. <coughs> Notice it comes off the left vein. The LAD, think about it. If that guy is occluded, anterior wall of the left ventricle, what will my complication be? Decreased cardiac output, tell me why. Because the heart's too pooped to pump. And what might that be called? Perfusion three, I'm giving a nod to Ms. Sherry Pezos, cardiogenic shock. Heart's too pooped to pump, babe, God bless you. She's gonna give you numbers. She's gonna give you cardiac output, four to eight liters. She's gonna give you cardiac index, 2.8 to 4.2 liters. Anything less than a cardiac index of two, less than 2.5, that's cardiogenic shock, that patient needs to abuse and And think about it. If the LV's too pooped to pump, blood won't move forward well, where's it gonna go? Back into the lungs. You ever saw acute pulmonary edema? Pink frothy sputum, tachypnic, O2 sats going down the toilet. You know what they need? They need Lasix. They need a diuretic. Get that fluid out of there. Slap that Foley in. Let's see him diurese. Interesting stuff. Make it sense? All because we trace the drop of blood through the heart, we can figure anything out. Just remember, where am I? Where am I? Okay. What else does that LAD feed? It feeds the front of that septal wall. You can have a VSD with that as well. And it feeds the bundles. In reference to dysrhythmia complications for heart attacks, RCA, we've already established symptomatic bradycardia. LAD, V-fib, baby. V-fib pulses VTAC. That's the code blue. And in your code blue HPS, in your second rotation, you will have, I'm pretty sure, a VFib scenario. Don't wrap me up and say, tell me, Strasbourg, you already knew that. 
and what you will do, there's gonna be eight of you or seven of you in the group, somebody's the team leader, somebody's the primary nurse, somebody's doing airway, the recorder, compressions, the med nurse, da 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 da. At the end, when you get a pulse back, what's the differential diagnosis? Get a STAT-12 lead. Was this a STEMI? Get into the cath lab. I think we should get a 12 lead. And Ms. Trosco's gonna say, who said that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then there's the circumflex. Feeds the side and the back of the heart. Picks up the slack on the SA node and the AD node. Keep the atropine close by. Not gonna test you on that nitpick stuff, but it's empowering when you look at a 12 lead EKG and see the area that that feeds to anticipate what might happen. You've already had Ms. Nelsia Alexis teach you pericarditis. The innermost layer is the endocardium, myocardium, epicardium, and the outside layer is the pericardial sac. Pericarditis, she told you, could be a, like a virus or something, and then they get chest pain. So they come to the hospital, and we assess that chest pain with that PQRST, and we get a 12 lead, and oh dear Lord, they have ST elevation in their relief. That's not a heart attack, my friends. That's inflammation of the pericardial sac. But did you know a complication from an MI could be Dressler syndrome? Not on the test, but four weeks after the MI, they get pericarditis. Can you imagine how scary it would be for a patient who just survived a heart attack, that's home now with his family, and they get chest pain, and I'm talking bad chest pain. Which, of course, is relieved with sitting up and leaning forward, because you're taking the pressure off. Chest pain from a heart attack is not reproducible, and it doesn't go away when you sit them up and lean them forward. Just saying. It's treated with NSAIDs, all that kind of good stuff. So how you like that? Scary. One of the coolest things I did as a nurse when I was a clinical nurse specialist in upstate New York, and it was a project I'd done in graduate school at LSU. And um, <coughs> I started a post-coronary discharge club for patients that have had a heart attack, you and your your wife, your kids can come. It's the last Thursday of every month. You come to the hospital and each Thursday night, each one Thursday night of the month, we'll have a guest speaker like the dietitian or George from pharmacy, brown bag your medications. The patient would come in with all their meds, lay them out on the table and George would tell them the good, the bad, and ooh, buddy, you shouldn't be mixing these two together. It was fantastic. And I still, not anymore, because this was back before 1998, I got Christmas cards from so many of them, and as they moved on to heaven, the Christmas cards stopped coming. But we had, that was one of the most rewarding things I ever did. Because it is scary when you go home after a heart attack, and we don't want that patient to be a cardiac invalid. We want them to go to cardiac rehab to find that, their mojo back, because it's scary. I know I'd be scared. Risk factors, we're in the driver's seat to educate our patients. There's some things we can't control. You get older, African Americans, higher incidence, heredity, mom, dad, brother, sister, sex. It's not just a man's disease where men present at the age of 55, women present at the age of 65. So I'm getting my cholesterol checked on Monday. I have to be NPO after midnight and I can't drink coffee. She said, you can have black coffee. I'm like, That's, there's no way possible I can drink black coffee um, because of this. Cholesterol is everything. It's the biggest problem because that plaque that you're about to see is lipid rich. We have to control their cholesterol. HDL is good. You want that to at least be higher than 45, preferably 60. I'm not gonna test you on that number, but I will test you on the LDL number. Note to self, note to self. LDL's the bad guy. LDL's the bad guy. Back in 1982, when I graduated from nursing school, we want to keep the LDL below 130. Well, honey, now they want to keep that LDL below 100. And, but wait, there's more. In the cath lab recently, my Tuesday people, we met Dr. Saxima, I think it was the first day of orientation, and he did a case and he said, oh no, I want his LDL less than 70 because he has co other comorbid factors like diabetes. So are you hearing me? When, You've got somebody with diabetes, we want to rob Peter to pay Paul. We don't want their LDL less than 100. We want it less than 70. But on Paul. You with me? Cholesterol is big. Hypertension, 
hurts the muscle, man. You don't want to overwork that heart muscle. Cigarette smoking, don't even get me started. Just, it causes cancer, it causes heart disease, it's nicotine, it's a constrictor. My daddy smoked, that's why I have a personal pet peeve. That's why he died young at the age of 75, and my girls were only four and six. And their memories of their papa is in the videos, you know? Um, diabetes, Rock had diabetes. If you don't control the sugars, and Mickey tried as best she could, you lose the elasticity of your vessel walls. Physical inactivity, that's easily fixed. Get the okay from your doc. Hey, can I start walking around the block? Sure, when it's not 104 degrees outside. I mean, seriously, that was like tragic. I'm happy. I opened the door this morning, I'm like, not quite a cool breeze, God bless you, but any, it's getting a little better. Um, weight, that trunkal obesity puts you at risk, friends. Greater fat absorption. Mm -mm 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 stress what do you do with stress i'm gonna buy some bluebell or hey i'm a splurge i'm going to get ben and jerry's fish food that's what i'm gonna do if it's on sale at cbs with my coupon i'm a big coupon person at cbs personality you want to know what type a personality looks like take a picture <laughs> just take a picture it's me all right i'm sorry and it might help me get an a on the test but too much of it isn't a good thing my four wednesday group this week i caught a train no, not a train, a school bus on the way coming in. I'm going down the airline highway and there's a school bus. And I was, I could have gone past it without getting ticket, but I said, no. The little thing came out, so I stopped. And I said, you know what, I'm gonna embrace this beautiful moment because there were 12 precious kids getting on the school bus. And they got on the school bus and then the bus didn't move. And the bus didn't move for four minutes. I'm like, is there a medical emergency on the boat? What's going on? So I just sat there. I didn't toot my horn, but now there's 20 cars deep on both sides of airline highway. Somebody went, move. And then you could see just a lady walking away, a mom just chit-chatting, bye-bye. Mm -hmm. And I was like, girl, <laughs> big time late for clinical. You know? So stress is not good. So you know what, Wendy Garrison? Leave a little early. Maybe don't take airline. Next time you see the little thing, just go. <laughs> Go past it quicker. Hey, women. Lucky duck, Chris. Is Chris the only fella in the room? When we go through menopause, and it will happen, girls, it's not that bad, really. Is it? Um, you lose your cardioprotective estrogen. Does that mean everybody should have a, you know, estrogen replacement therapy? Nope. Not if you have a history of breast cancer with an estrogen positive tumor. You know what I'm saying? That's me. I'm on anti-estrogen. I take tamoxifen. I was supposed to take for five years, but I heard through the grapevine, there's benefits to take it to 10, so I think I'm seven years in. And it's all good. And I haven't grown a beard yet. I keep checking, you know. Um, and certainly there's no muscles. I have no muscle mass whatsoever. And oral contraceptives is a way of life, but that in combination with smoking, you're asking for a blood clot. Yeah, asking for a blood clot. And here comes the problem. And I know you have your ticket to class, so God bless you. Oh, that's just a call. Today, we're gonna compare unstable angina to non-STEMI to STEMI according to patho, 12 lead EKG changes, labs, and how do we treat them? There's a lot of similarities between the three. Normal vessel, this has gotta be a baby in utero because I know fatty streaks begin to develop early on. I had my little girls and we went to play group at McDonald's and they were not even two years old. I was like, this is a French fry, here you go. I mean, we start early. In Louisiana, we like our seafood and we like it fried and this fatty streak becomes fibrous plaque. But I don't want you to think all of a sudden one day it just all closes up and there lies the problem. There's a clot. Now you see this one? I like this picture because you can see typically the 70% occlusion, just the sheer force of blood flowing through that makes that endothelial line break, and then all of a sudden you're gonna have a problem because when this lipid-rich rich plaque is exposed to blood, call on platelets, call on platelets, come to the scene of a plaque rupture. That's why we say, chew this aspirin. Have you two ever said that? Chew it. Can I swallow it? Chew it. Faster absorption. What does that do? It is an antiplatelet. It blocks the rhomboxane A2. Oh, that's a blood thinner, Ms. Karen. No, it's not. It's an antiplatelet. Tell me really what it is. Okay. So we know it's not just that the plaque, 
there's a clot. And it's a lipid-rich plaque core. So we really care about the statins, and we really care about the antiplatelets. Doesn't that just make sense? And you know, it can be different compositions, but what, compositions, but what happens is now you're blocking the road. You're blocking the coronary artery. That's not good. So let's let's get rid of that. And you'll see in our case study, man, you <coughs> can get it from all angles. That guy even got a 5,000 unit bolus bolus of heparin, IV push. Not good, we don't like it, not gonna ask you nitpicky stuff like that. But what we now know is it's not just we worry about the guy with the ST elevation. We pay close attention to the patient with unstable angina, the patient with ST depression and or T wave inversion, a non STEMI. And by the way, those are the same EKG changes for unstable angina. We'll talk more about that. And uh, ST elevation. What does ST elevation look like? I'll show you what ST elevation looks like. And it's all over your handouts and all that kind of good stuff. But I'm good at drawing ST elevation. And it looks like this. Remember, that ST segment was supposed to come down like that. This is ST elevation. This is an injury pattern. And we are running to the cath lab. Sure, I'll draw your labs, but I'm not waiting 60 minutes for that lab to say, the troponin's ready. Well, we're already done. He's already in CCU. He's already done. Unstable angina, you know what we called it, Dr. Kim Yu and I, when we were seniors in nursing school, May of 82? Pre-infarction angina. So it's like the TIA to a stroke. It's not a matter of if you're gonna have an MI, it's just a matter of when. So you really need to control the risk factors. And American College of Cardiology, American Heart, they were real smart in the year 2000 and said, look, we are discharging way too many non-STEMIs and they're dropping dead the next day, we're gonna keep them. We're gonna keep them, because they're at high risk too. Hey, let me ask you a question. Can unstable angina folks and non-STEMI folks, can they go to the cath lab too? Of course they can, but we're not running to the cath lab, and they'll probably go tomorrow morning. Maybe later today, but we're not running. It's not an acute, acute, acute emergency. There's plenty of other stuff we can do. Now, the 12 lead's a great tool. Now, if it were me, if somebody had chest pain, I consider it a luxury, and we'll, after break, we'll examine the chest pain, but you already know it, PQRST, you probably knew that before, Miss Nelsia Alexis. Examine the chest pain, assess the chest pain. And you know, you nurses with the computerized stuff, it'll have a script for you. Is it sharp, is it dull? Who was with me this week? I think it might be, I can't remember. I think it was you, your guy last week, that, um, sir, Tell me about your chest pain. And what did he say? Do you remember what he said? Uh, yeah, it came on all of a sudden. Um, it was stabbing in the center of his chest. Did he say it was a tight rubber band from here to here? No. Who was with me? What student was with me when the man said it was a tight rubber band from here to here? Because that's not going to be on your script. So I don't ever want you to just be minimized or limited by the script. Ask the patient, how was your pain? That's the point I wanted to make. Thank you for that. Um, assess their chest pain. We're gonna find out diabetics and elderly females, they don't even feel their chest pain. They come in with chest pain equivalents, which is down in the slides, like shortness of breath, nausea, sweaty. Um, so the 12 lead man, fantastic. 12 lead's a great tool. I love his picture. And you have these slides. I'm a very visual learner. The first tippy top bar of your patho to compare unstable angina, non STEMI, and STEMI. Give me a give me a ticket to class, anybody. Anybody got one? Oh, it's a computer fancy. Yeah. Oh, may I borrow yours? Thank you. Thank you, little Charlie. Look at her, she already filled out. So, underlying patho for unstable angina, first bullet, get ready to write. Lipid rich plaque core. I'll get that back to you. Lipid rich plaque core. Do we agree? And the second bullet is calling all platelets. Now let's look and see this. Oh, here's the cross section of the coronary artery. I see that lipid rich plaque core. And what do you know? With that endothelial line broke, calling all platelets, 
Look at nature's band-aid. See those platelets blocking the road? Chew the aspirin. Who is that on? Unstable angina, non-STEMI, and STEMI. Oh my God, you're right, Ms. Garrison. Look, it's the same thing. Lipid-rich plaque core when the endothelial lining broke, calling off platelets. So your first two bullets under unstable angina, draw an arrow all the way across, babe. Because the underlying path, though, for all three is lipid-rich plaque core, calling all platelets. So already, treatment down at the bottom, you know they're going to be getting statins, and you know they're going to be getting antiplatelets. Doesn't that just make sense? <coughs> God did not bless me with common sense. I had to acquire it over four decades in nursing, seriously. So how we like that, but wait. I spy with my little eye a different color in the STEMI guy. What color is it? Red. Red blood cells, baby. Red blood cells fibrin. Mm, mm, mm. And there lies the difference. That's why this guy is more of an emergency, and that's this guy we're running to the cath lab. Now let me ask you a trick question. Does every hospital in the United States have a cath lab? No. More hospitals don't have a cath lab. So what in the heck are we gonna do at a hospital with no cath lab? We can't run them in the cath lab. You gotta give them fibrinolytic therapy. What? Fibrinolytic therapy. Lady to see in Galliano, great little hospital. They don't have a cath lab. Man's at a fishing tarpon rodeo, catches the big one. Oh, chest pain, get you the lady to see. No cath lab in sight, but they're gonna do zero to 30 minute door to needle on the fibrinolytic therapy. They'll blow that out the water, no pun intended, because he was fishing at the time of his chest pain. You with me? Medicines, risk <coughs> benefit, risk benefit. If there's no benefit and only risk, then why in the heck would you give it? I want the same answer from all of you all at the same time. Would you ever give fibrinolytic therapy to the unstable angina or to the non-steady patient? No. no, tell me why. Because it doesn't have the red blood cells and the fibrin. It would be no benefit, only risk. What kind of risk am I talking about? I'm talking about a head bleed. I'm talking about, we accidentally gave the fibrinolytic and we killed your daddy. You think those words are ever gonna come out of the healthcare professional? No, no. We had a little, little incident at the bedside. None of my students, everybody was good. But both of them had documented um, medication error averted, bullet dodged, and I was like, don't write that in your notes. There's a way to say it, but don't say that. You know what I mean? And let's be honest, let's say what our assessment was, it was just a little too much fentanyl was given, but it's all good. And the patient was kind of coming to us for 10 minutes. Luckily, they were on the bed, and then they woke up. I was like, girls, get the wet rags. Wake them up. Check those pupils. And it was all good. It happens. Nurses, you're going to do something. Make an error in some kind of way. You just have to own it. Own it, and we can fix it. Don't ever try to hide it, because we can't fix it if you try to hide it. All right. How are we doing on our underlying path, though? of the three. Hey, but guess what? Both of them could suddenly die. This is why we're not sending you unstable agent and not steady people home. You're getting admitted to um, the unit. We've had folks in our unit with non stemmies that are gonna go to the cath lab the next morning. Don't panic over this slide. All it's saying is, do they have SC elevation? Um, no, they don't have ST elevation. It could be unstable angina or non-STEMI, but here lies the difference. Unstable angina, your markers will be negative. I'm about to show you the EKG changes, a real picture of them, and it'll help you understand it more. So this is kind of ahead of schedule, but your markers didn't bump for unstable angina, but they bumped for non-STEMI because the damage was significant enough for the markers to rise. That sentence is already in your hand now. It's like two lines below where I'm at right now. I love this slide. Put your pens down. You already have this slide. Let's look at this. Tippy top, you've got a lipid rich plaque core. Sheer force of blood flowing past it. And it, and it um, causes a rupture of the plaque. Calling all platelets. Now you've got a clot. 
decreased blood flow patient in the ER. Hopefully patient in the ER. Hopefully they called 911 and didn't drive himself to the hospital. Mm -mm -mm. Why is that man driving so crazy in front of me? non stemmy and unstable angina, we've already said, they've got the same exact underlying pathway, the, the lipid-rich plaque, the platelets, but the non stemmy the occlusion is significant enough to make the markers rise, and the markers are troponin. Troponin and CKMB. We'll talk about those when we get to those slides. Unstable angina, the markers are typically negative. Now, in your life as a nurse, we cannot be black and white. Not Ms. Garrett, since she told me in unstable angina the markers would never be positive. I'm sure there's always going to be a zebra in the room. Mm -hmm. I love this slide. This, who's going to be an ER nurse? This is why we give five milligrams of metaprolol IV push. There was a little Darian DeGrusha in bed K two weeks ago that had the opportunity to push the five milligrams of uh, metaprolol, and I said, how about you and I just stand here and we're going to watch the RN? Because let me tell you something, this could make your patient's pressure bottom out. So I just wanted her for her first five milligrams of metaprolol to observe. Now, luckily, that patient had an arterial line. So we could watch the blood pressure. And the reason her patient was getting it wasn't an MI situation, it was AFib RBR. You remember that? Do you? Was that you? Or was it so? It wasn't. Who was it? Who in bed K? It wasn't you, I could have sworn it was you. It was me. Who's me? Um, hi, Kate. Yeah. That, that was interesting. Minnie. Minnie. Say that again. Little Minnie. Little mm -hmm. Minnie. Minnie was a 72 year old Minnie. Her, her mama name is Minnie. And respiratory, her lungs just couldn't oxygenate anymore. And she decided, I don't want to be intubated. Take off this BiPAP, AVAP, whatever you call it. Her whole family was there. And when that little 11 year old grandson left the room crying, we were all, it was all, we were all destroyed. Man, it was you. It kind of looked alike. Light eyes, the dark hair, they kind of look alike. Um, all right, let's look at this. Hey, I've got diminished blood flow. That hurts those cells. Their cell membrane integrity. It decreases contractility. That decreases cardiac output. You know, Cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. For perfusion one, we were talking about the heart rate. Too fast, not good. Too slow, not good. Not there at all, even worse. Today we're talking about not so much stroke volume, that'll be perfusion three, but the three determinants of stroke volume, you know, are preload, your volume, afterload, the resistance, and contractility. Today we're talking about the heart to poop to pump. So, heart's too poop to pump, blood pressure falls. But you know, the way God created us, hey, baroreceptors, do your thing. Ooh, we sense a low blood pressure. Fight or flight, babe, cue the adrenaline. Epinephrine and adrenaline are the same thing, and they come from our brain, you know? So, um, adrenaline, catecholamine, does the two worst things that could possibly happen for this heart attack patient. Let's increase their heart rate and let's clamp them down. You think that's a good thing for a hurting heart muscle? Uh-uh, it's only gonna eat up your oxygen, which would not be good. So what we do right here, the ER doc will say, hey nurse, go ahead and give the first five milligrams of metaprolol IV push. If I were going to give you a right order question, and it's an old question, it's not on your chest, but I want you to know this as real ER nurses, I'd get a good manual blood pressure, a good baseline blood pressure. And be a thinking nurse. If the pressure's 80 over 60, are you even gonna give that metaprolol? Heck no. You just say, doc, the pressure's 80 over 60. Oh, don't give it. Get a manual. Then put the nib on. I'd cycle it for three minutes, so while you're pushing it slowly over five minutes, we can see if there's a reduction in systolic, and you could stop in the middle of the dose. Hey, doc, I'm three minutes in, and I'm just saying his systolic 76, stop, thanks. What's her, what's her name? You with me? Be a thinking nurse. Why do you want to give this medicine? Lots of reasons why you want to give it, but why would you want to hold it? Their heart rate's too, sl too slow and their blood pressure's too low. Then here's the pictures. This is your STEMI. 
Now that, that Q wave is pretty deep. I'll explain a pathologic Q wave in a couple of slides, but there is a current level of injury and we are running to the cath lab. Someone asked a fantastic question yesterday afternoon in class and they said, hey Ms. Garrison, on our case study, we didn't run to the cath lab right away. You know why? Because it was Sunday and we had to call out the team. So until the team was there, we couldn't run to the cath lab. We're running to the cath lab here. Hopefully, if you're gonna have an MI, have it Monday through Friday, because typically on the weekend, the cath lab is closed, I'm just saying. All right, tell your mom and dad and your, your papa and mama, don't have a heart attack on the weekend. But you know what, Saints games, kind of classic, you know. Um, 600,000 people have STEMIs. 1.4 million people have non-STEMIs and unstable angina. This is much more common. Check out that ST depression. Just to be fair, I'll draw ST depression over here. But I'm a really good drawer of ST elevation, but I have to cheat to do the ST depression. P wave, R wave goes up. I, I didn't mean for that PR interval to be non-existent. R wave goes up, but there you go. That's hard to draw by myself. I have to cheat. All right, you with me? Both your non-STEMI and your unstable angina can have ST depression and or T wave inversions. So if you saw this on a test, you're thinking non-STEMI, unstable angina. If you see this on the test, you're thinking STEMI. All right, 12 lead is fantastic. And you know what? We want it done in five minutes, five minutes. I know one of my slides says 10 minutes, but it's five minutes. All right, this is normal. <coughs> this is somebody that's cutting their grass and they get some chest pain and they maybe get some T wave inversion. Ischemia starts from the inside out. And if they don't stop and rest, supply and demand, it's going to, the damage is gonna keep evolving like a bullseye. Then ischemia would turn to injury and then injury would turn to infarct. So what you see in the middle is the darker color. That little piece of heart muscle is dead and gone. And what's dead and gone cannot be reperfused. So they will not go home with their normal ejection fraction of 55 or 70%. They might go home with the EF of 40 or 30. Fair enough, stop it in its tracks. There was a paramedic class yesterday, and I know Chris is, and I know you're an EMT, you can give sublingual nitro, right? But you're not giving the IV tridel in the rib, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll talk about nitroglycerin. Stemi, running to the cath lab. Running to the cath lab, if you have the cath lab. And if you don't, consider lytic therapy if they're eligible. You think you want to give fibrolytic therapy to just anybody? I'm not going to ask you what the absolute contraindication, contraindications are, but it stands to reason you just had major surgery last week. You're on Eliquis and your INR7. You ain't getting it. You oh, can't get your pressure below uh, 220 over 110. You're gonna blow. Makes sense. All right. But STEMIs, we're running. Some people do go on to develop pathologic Q waves. In the first perfusion one class, we learned the first little downward dip is a Q wave. But when it's deep and wide, and I know I have, a, I have a picture of it, it's coming up, I'm sorry. But pathologic Q wave means, dude, it's dead and gone. And sadly, it's gonna always stay in your EKG. Now that diabetic person that doesn't feel his chest pain, he may go for his annual visit, the doc does a routine 12 lead. Buddy, you got, you got Q waves. Well, did you ever have chest pain over the last year? No, there was a week I felt real bad, I thought I had the flu. I'm not making this stuff up. Okay, 12 lead, five minutes. Cross that out, five minutes. I want it done in five minutes. And in our case study guide, we did it in four minutes. But that was the ER, I was in CCU, I can't take credit for that. And I want you to be able to recognize ST elevation and you need to recognize ST depression and or T wave inversion. STEMI, we're running. This is what a STEMI looks like. This is a 12 lead EKG. Lead one, lead two, lead three. Augmented voltage right, the positive pole is here to the right. That's why, 
That baby's always downwardly deflected because electricity in the heart flows down and left. It's not flowing toward that positive pole up here. Augmented voltage left, A, B, F. V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. In your pre-class workbook, you have the V lead locations. I'm not going to test you on that, but if you want to get an accurate 12 lead, you will assess your landmarks. Okay, clavicle, first intercostal space, and second. Fourth intercostal space, right sternal border is V1. Put the little tab there. V2, 3, <coughs> 4, 5, 6. See that SC elevation? See that? You see that? You see that? You see that? Hey, V5 and 6 are on the lateral side. This isn't just anterior in the front, it's anterolateral. I bet you it's the LAD and the CERC, or maybe a left main. Does that make sense? Because where the de decreased flow is, this is the area that looks at that region. That's kind of redundant, but it's the picture that's looking at the region. Okay, so if they came to the unit, what lead will we want to monitor them in? Maybe lead two, just for good measure, but V leads. Come on, if there's a hurricane and a big old cypress tree goes through your kitchen, put the cameras on the kitchen and not the dining room. Put the camera, put the monitor, put the lead where the damage is. Does that make sense? You read me like a newspaper? Q waves are indicative of old damage. They cannot, that, that damage means, dude, it's always going to be there, and it means that we can't reproduce. You, you've lost some heart muscle. That's what they look like. They're wide and they're deep, at least a third the height. <coughs> now, I'm never going to trick you but on purpose, but if you see this with still a current level of injury, we're running in the cath lab. Let's salvage what we can. You're not going to say, oh, darn, he's got Q waves. We can't help him. If they still have any kind of current level of injury, let me try to draw that. It would look like this. The first down we did is pretty deep. That's really bad. That's really bad. But you went a deep Q wave. I'd still go to the cath lab. I still have a current level of injury. Let's salvage what we can. That's ridiculously deep. I, I have to fix it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't live with that. I just cannot. That's so just it. No, you could. Yeah, you're right. Can we see your pain? That is funny. She's a needle with it. Um, you're right. How's that? It's deep and it's wide. Is it more than one third the height of the arm wave? Let's make it a little a little longer. Now it is. All right. Okay. Who has seen this kind of poster in a break room or a locker room at a hospital somewhere? It's a real common poster, and it's wonderful because it says the inferior wall, the left ventricle. Here's the leads. The leads that look down. Lead two looks down. Lead three looks down. Augmented voltage foot looks at the inferior wall. You don't know, have to know these clusters for the test, but if you're going to work in the ER, it would behoove you to know this, or in critical care. Septal, V1, V2, but I always, you know, the dividing septal wall, I always think of that as anterior as well. V3, V4, I like to say these are my anterior septal people. Lateral, V5, V6, and then I have my high lateral, leaves one and ABL. All right, and then here's the summary chart to say who's the culprit. Well, when it's inferior, it's the RCA, babe. When it's the LAD, there's your anterior septal people, the front of the left ventricle, the anterior wall of the left ventricle. Now, I don't want an MI, but I'd rather, I'd rather an inferior wall than an anterior wall. Tell me why. What's the complication of the anterior wall, the big mamma chump, big mamma jamma pump of the LV? Who's worse? He's worse. Pump problems, cardiogenic shock problems, pulmonary edema problems. That's just a little symptomatic for any cardio. I'll go home with pacemaker if I have to. You probably won't have to, but the lesser of two evils. And so chest pain units were designed to hold people. 
We don't want to inadvertently send somebody home to die because non-steady folks are at high risk. Almost time for your break. If you have pain at rest for more than 20 minutes, seriously, go, go to pop, call 911. Troponin, change that to greater than 0 0.04. It's, it's somewhere else in your handout, I promise. New ST depression. The glory of the computer age is we can call for their old 12 lead kg. Back when I was you a senior nurse at school, we'd have to call for their old records. And it might take till tomorrow to get that big, thick manila folder from medical records. It was kind of hilarious. Um, sustained VTAC. Well, that could be a problem. But we will talk about reperfusion arrhythmias after break. Like, sometimes when we open up the infarct-related artery, the ventricles get excited and they have like a little run of VTAC. It's like, woo! Um, pulmonary edema. We've already talked about it new or worsening mitral regurge. Where's that blood flowing past? Through the mitral valve, right? I swear, my assessment at 8 a.m., I heard love dove, but at 9.30, when my patient calls me in and they're symptomatic, they're, I'm hearing a swoosh, shh, 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 call the doctor. S3, Kentucky, 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 Kentucky. That's an S3 gout, that's ventricular overload. You know what's worse? Tennessee, 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 and S4 is worse. Hypotension, bradycardia, tachycardia. The complications from an MI in reference to dysrhythmias run the gamut from Brady to V-fib and everywhere in between. Older folks, higher risk to die. Why they do, do what they did yesterday on that 59-year-old? Because he was young. 59 is young. All right. Take a break. It's 9.22. How about 